relationship, and I can, I can get the job done, and I can set up, I can mind produce the event or the the, the play in a way that enables other people to do their work. But I feel like um, the the real collaborative relationships that I built have been predicated on something else. I mean, I, re I remember even um, uh, when I was many years ago, when I was a literary manager at Manhattan Theater Club. <coughs> We were developing a play at the time by John Patrick Shelley, with whom I just ended up working in the Atlantic, but uh, who is n notoriously kind of solitary, especially solitary, the way that he works as a writer. And he doesn't seek a lot of feedback from other people. But when Matt O'Leary, the artistic director, had a lot of feelings about this particular play, and we all did about what might need to happen with it. And she said, and he hates the word John Turner. He won't, he doesn't like to use it, he won't use it. Uh, and, and, uh, he, uh, according to when, at least that was the case, and I remember her saying, you know, like the way the way for you forward to to, to make a connection with John is is not going to be to to sort of march up to him and proclaim your role in the theater. It's going to be to make sure you introduce yourself to him at an opening night party and see if if you guys hit it off. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was my role in the organization to kind of look out for this project as we were working on it, and that's sort of how it evolved. You know, like I, and we ended up having a nice collaboration as it were, I didn't really collaborate with him so much on the play, but he, he ended up soliciting some feedback from me and invited me over to his apartment at one point to hear a reading. And, you know, the, it was more than, than, you know, it might have been with somebody else, and certainly more than if it was somebody who just marched in and said, like, well, John Dr. Chenley, I am the institutional monitor here, and I'm, I'm here to explain to you what's wrong with your play, even though I'm, you know, significantly less experienced than you are, and you are know, genius. You know, like, like, you know, so, I don't know, I think, I think it really is probably about that. Even with, with Leslie, I mean, I mean, we worked together, but I already knew that I liked her a lot. You know, it was When I worked at your play, it wasn't, it yeah, didn't I feel like that was a selection No, process. I know, it was, I know. But we already had a whole way of speaking to each other. Yeah. Because we work together at Columbia in the dramaturgy department, so we share students and we talk about dramaturgy a lot. And we had a whole history to build on when we went into production for the play. Yeah. And I also really trusted that you understood my play. I knew that before we went into it. Right. And you were funny too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was just thinking too about the um, the sort of relative to Anne's comment about the creating the circumstances or whatever for, for collaboration or for success rather than looking at results. And I actually think that the, the way to do that is pretty simple. Yeah. It, it's actually, if you, particularly if you're, you're a director of a project, because I think it's often the director's role, but it can also be the artistic director's role or, or my role as an artistic director sometimes, which is to orient everybody that you're putting together in the room in the same direction or to put them all in the same direction, which is towards the work. It's not towards their own needs or their own gratification or their own insecurities. That that you, the job is to get everybody on, in the room on board with the same idea. You know that what you're working towards, um, and that's that that can, can amount to agreement about what is the story that you're telling. It can amount to agreement about the fact that a writer is going to continue to work, and the actors should know that, and that the actors can bring something, something to that process, but that they should also be willing to roll with getting new patients. Um, to a certain point, it can be, um, it can be about making sure that, you know, it's, it just, it, it's also just about taking, respecting and acknowledging what work people are doing, sort of seeing, you know, seeing what they're, process. I know that also very vague to me, but I really think it's about making sure everybody is committed to the work first and their own issues, you know, really set up from the distance, I think. You know, you know I'm, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still thinking about the word conditions. Could you repeat that sentence again? Yeah. You cannot create results. You can only create conditions in which something might happen. Okay, I'm not sure I understand that. I think <laughs> conditions. Like, what, okay, see that word? No. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. That's what I was afraid it might be. Um, well, we can switch like, questions. Also, <laughs> well, no, wait. Now that I'm trusting, I'm on it a little bit, I okay. think. Um, <laughs> 
what, what I've been thinking since you, since you gave us that sentence is it, it's two different things for an actor and a writer. Yes. And, and I experience it different ways when I was an actor and when I'm a writer. I, for me as an actor, that, that dream, that idealism that you're going to walk into a room that's a safe place so that you can be so vulnerable, you can investigate yourself, I honestly think that that safety is up to you to find for yourself. I actually think that. That the investigation, and as I spoke to my group that I had earlier, that one of the people that, that I have learned from is Olympia Dukakis, who has an amazing ability to go after what she needs. And, and she's been such an example to me of a woman who pursues herself with a, a, a fierce and, 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 and a, 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 a conscientious appetite which has allowed her to figure out her role in a play. Now, would other people call her a good collaborator? Perhaps not. She's not that interested in what you're doing. She's interested in what she's doing. But her performance is usually something that makes the play or the movie work. So I, I don't know how that fits into making it safe, except that she can do that for herself. And I've always admired that. As a, just a minute, Ken. As a, a, um, a, a writer, uh, to be really frank with you, I don't always know how to keep myself safe in a room. I'm not sure as a playwright when to speak. You don't always get to work with somebody who asks your opinion, who advises you in a kind of way that you hear things. Yes, you know this. So that in America, when playwrights are working with their collaborators as a playwright, it hasn't always been so easy to be able to say, this is driving me crazy, this is really wrong, things are, it, 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 don't, it doesn't sound right, should I leave the room, can I speak now? You don't always know. You don't always know what your place is as a writer, and the, the kind of zeitgeist feeling about it is that writers aren't supposed to talk that much. Now, when I was with you, you didn't mind. My, my speaking out and often turn to me and ask me, that's not always the case. So conditions, I don't know what they are. And I don't also, know. I've also asked writers to leave the rehearsal for yeah. extended periods of time um, because I needed to do certain kinds of work. Yeah, that happened with us, but yeah. it was something I understood and it was the right time for it to happen. Yeah. It's, 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 the, it's a playwright being welcomed into the room. I'm, I'm just trying to deal with this conditions. What are the conditions that make a playwright feel welcome? And, and what is the contract for the playwright? It's, it's not that clear. But I would feel, I mean, as somebody who is a, a devotee of immediate gratification, <laughs> I yes. feel that one of the conditions of creating a successful collaboration is that Everyone is on the same page about this is a process. Uh -huh. You don't have to find the answer right now. And things can be not good in order to get to the good part. And it doesn't mean, I don't mean not good, but you know, sort of not fully shaped or formed. And as a producer, I feel part of my role is to understand that and to be encouraging. Mm -hmm. And by the way, yes. I didn't always do that, and I'm humiliated about things that I think about from the past where it's like, oh my God, why didn't I know that then? But um, you know, but for me also, it has been a mm -hmm. process of learning mm -hmm. how to ask questions. And, and I am a, a, a pretty convincing salesperson, so I often have to say to a writer, look, it, or like, these are my words, or here's the bad words version. Because I never want a writer to take my ideas, because they're not going to be good. The only ideas that are good from a writer is from the writer. Mm -hmm. So um, it, you have to establish a language. So when I say, you know, so to me, conditions means, OK, what's our deal? Our deal is that we're going to listen to one another. Our deal is that we're going to feel, we're going to trust each other, and that we're going to trust that this process is going to lead us Somewhere. But don't you feel that has to be earned? That you can't just say, oh, we're going to trust each other. I don't trust people who say that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you don't have to say it. It just happens. You <laughs> trust is earned. No, no, no. Trust is so we never, fight for. Well, we never had to say well, that's that. That's because we got along. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to try someone else. 
somebody asked back. me to trust them. You don't, you don't oh, say, will you trust me? Of course not. <laughs> That's what you are saying. Why are we going? It is, it really is. Right. It's like, look at my sleeve bag, aren't you? It's like when somebody says, oh, um, oh trust me. It's like, oh. Right. Right. Uh, the, uh, the idea that I think you have to from the producing side or from the, from the artistic leadership side is that I, I don't think there are like uh, sort of conditions that you could describe that one could make generalizations about at all. I think my job is to make sure that every collaborator, every artist who's involved in the creation of a new play, uh, or a revival for that matter, any play, uh, is um, enabled to do their best work to, to, yeah. to the best, to the degree that I can understand what that is, or that I can, and so that, that can mean setting boundaries around people too. That can, that can, <laughs> that can mean looking at knowing who is directing the show and knowing where they're gonna veer off yeah. to the left and leave somebody behind. Or knowing that you have a particularly excellent designer who brings a certain kind of vocabulary into the room who should be given a voice. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. you have a particular actor who tends to dominate. Yeah. Like a certain actor yes. in your play. Yes. Who tends to direct the other actors and the director and the player on simultaneously. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, you know, and so in order to set and, and so there were a lot of setting the conditions for work in mm -hmm. Leslie's production that I directed. Mm -hmm was about managing that personality. Yeah. It wasn't about like creating, you know, the, a platform for butterflies and rainbows and your fans. It was about, you know, actually you can't talk that way to people. Right, but you also know, making sure uh, that the work was the center of yeah. the process. It was it didn't yes. it, it didn't have to get right. hostile or or mean spirited, but, it, it, but there was a process of saying like actually thank you for your ideas right. but stop talking about them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we'll, or we'll talk about yeah. them later. You know, I mean, yeah. the, the, there's a lot of that, and that that for me in that case was my role as a director. But but I, we often, even when we're visiting one of those rooms, as as as, uh, as Neil Cabe and I do, we have to do some of that too, yeah. just to sort of observe what's happening and make sure that there isn't somebody in the room who is feeling right. like they couldn't do what they wanted to do because of the way in which everybody else was working. Mm -hmm. um, so listening, sharing passion, focusing on the work, and having someone like Christian around who can, who can enable all the collaborators to feel empowered to fill their role within the production. Yeah, I don't, but I don't think that saying. I have to be around. I think you set that up in the beginning. Right. I, I think agree. that the way that people enter the organization or the, or the, or the mm -hmm. process, if it's not an institutional production, um, sets people off in the right direction or it doesn't. You get a strong right. sense of the culture of the organization from the minute that you start to put together the creative team. That the, the new artists who come in get a feel for how the producers work and how they take care of people or not. And, yeah. You know, you know it's, I think that it, it's the director. I think that you need to feel that the director both knows exactly what he, she is doing and is open to impulse and that you have some sense of being able to trust that person. I know that's where I've gotten in trouble, where I haven't trusted my director, and then I, I act out. And it, 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 you know, I've, I've gotten in trouble in that way because I want to be, I want to investigate something that I'm not being invited to do or I don't trust an impulse. It, it has a lot to do with how a director holds a room. I personally think it's very hard to be a director, and I think there aren't many really good ones either. So finding a relationship with a director that you trust is a very good thing to do, because that's, that's what happens in a room. People investigate when they feel they are welcome to investigate. And then also, finally, someone has to make the decision. <laughs> say, this is now, now we're doing this. Yeah. Yeah. This is what it's going to look like. Yeah. 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 So if productions happen in a variety of different ways, starting with different people, how do you evaluate your collaborators, I guess, and how do you find collaborators when you have an idea for a new project? Are they all old relationships that they then realize maybe this person was good for this, or how do you find those collaborators? I'll collaborate. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I, I go to a lot of theater, and I am always interested in finding new talent 
writers, actors, directors. And for me, it's really about like, meeting that person and seeing if we can be in the room together without getting hives. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, like, I, I, I feel like I look, you know, being a director of uh, new plays is really hard. I mean, my experience. It is. It. And, and it's hard because, uh, particularly if you're oriented towards wanting to, do, to some, in some way, deliver what you believe is the playwright's truth and their vision of what they're really trying to do, even though you know it will not look like what is in their imagination precisely. But if you're trying to really serve that vision in some way, it's very hard because, in fact, the playwright will never see exactly what was in their mind. And so that there's, there's never going to be a complete alignment of, of those two ideas. And um, so I feel like I find I gravitate to, to writers who, with whom I have a, a relatively easy time getting to, uh, to some sense of agreement about yeah. what the story is and what they're doing and what techniques they've used to get there and where they feel like they can want to continue the work. Um, if, I, if we can agree on those things, that's a good stepping off point. But also, I've done really well by writers, and, and Leslie is one who did this too, who will push back on me, not to like criticize what I've done, but to say like, well, that's good, but it could be better. You know, that, that, they, that they have pushed me to do better work too, that it doesn't just sort of fall to me to disappoint the writer. It falls to me to like, advance the process and then they fall and then they push back and so that then we move forward together in the right way. But it's you never know how that's gonna go until you're kind of in it. Um, but I think with collaborators in general or when we're hiring people for projects that, that we're producing, I think I said this yesterday maybe, or at least it sounds like it I have. I always tell everyone, especially my students, I tell, you know, a number one rule in order to get ahead and find collaborators in this business is to not be an asshole. <laughs> and, and because we choose people to work with who we want to have around, we obviously look for the most talented people that we can find. But and not all theaters, you know, care as much about kind of who they're surrounding themselves with as, as I think we do generally at the Atlantic. But um, you know, it's no fun. I mean, but we didn't get into this business so that it would be horrible. You know, we. If it's not, if, it's, if nobody's having a good time because of some of the characters that you hired, it, it feels it goes very quickly from like idealism to why the hell did I ever do this in the first place? You know, what's the point? Um, so we, we choose personalities. We choose you know, I have a. Um, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I think that collaboration is, is so different at different times. You know, and that that it's. Um, you have different collaborators, collaborators at different times. Like I, I, with this play that, that who, those of you who come tonight that I'm reading a scene from, this play that I, I'm working on right now used to be a one-act play. And I'm, it grew up to a full-length play based on having been a one-act play. And for those of you who have tried to do that, I think we can agree that that's a hard thing to do, to make it take one act into a full-length, because it's like building a house on top of an apartment. It's, it's already a made thing, and you're trying to make it something else. Um, so I needed people around me. I needed to do a lot of readings of that. I needed to go to the people who I trusted. And I felt that I had people in my community just to hear it and listen to it. And then I had one reading in a theater that was very a, a successful, exciting theater, got very excited about my play, and told me, gave me some direct, flat-out advice that they would do it if I did one thing to it, which was take out all the direct address. And I did that. And then I brought it back, and the play didn't work anymore. And I felt that I had really stabbed my play in the heart. And just as I was listening to it, just as we were reading it for the same producers who loved it so much three weeks before, and were sitting like this three weeks before, and then were sitting like this the next week, and when it was over, the room was silent. Whereas before, it had been like, and the giddy feeling that I had of almost of being chosen and liked in that way allowed me to give up my good sense mm -hmm. and do something to my play that was wrong. And so I then had to retreat from all collaborators, figure out what my play was. And when I came out of that, I didn't do a reading. I sent the play to five close friends, Christian being one, Chris, 
Raggedy Mother, and asked, tell me what you think and tell me what to do. Mm -hmm. And that form of collaboration is what I needed at that time to refine the play. Also, I think when writers are looking for directors, you have to really know what, mm -hmm. what kind of work that director mm -hmm. does. Like you, do. you don't go to Peter Sellers to come from underneath your play and find <laughs> what your what the writer is trying to say. Peter has a vision that goes on top of whatever work he's doing. And it, it's quite beautiful and wonderful, but it's more about what's percolating in his mind and his interpretation. And if that's what you want for your play, then he's a wonderful choice as a collaborator. But, you know, it's like, you know, don't go to the hardware store for grapefruits. So, um, you know, you have to, you can admire somebody's work, but right. you need to know how they work, and if that's going to really fit in with the way that you work. And sometimes that doesn't happen immediately, and you know, you've got to get to know each other a little bit. But I think you need to be knowledgeable about the canon of someone's work. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm, that's good. you know, and, and, and look at the way that they see the world and the way that they interpret the world through the pieces they direct. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, writers also, good. young writers need to remember that they actually have a great deal of sway oh, yes. in that conversation when they're when you're if you're in a position to have your play produced, um, you know if you feel like you found collaborators that a, a particular director that you have really that you really trust that really really makes your work and that really makes you feel good and like the work can be successful on your terms, uh, it's important to advocate for those people. Um, because theaters will often sort of say, well, we've got our, you know, our five people that we tend to go to a lot, and those people may be very good. And they, some of them may be a really good match for you as a writer. But if there's something that you really trust, you can always say, will you at least meet with this person, even if they don't know them? You know, will you at least take a meeting and sit down and talk with them about the play um, before we go to somebody fancier, or before yeah. we go to somebody that you know and therefore feel more comfortable with. I think writers often don't do that because they're so eager for the opportunity right. and they're so frightened right. that the opportunity will go away that they don't um, that they don't use the um, leverage that they have to their own best advantage. Mm -hmm. So let's say that you have you pick the right director, it's the right time for your piece, you're in the right place, there's still gonna be some conflict inherent in collaborating with other people. How do, you, how do you deal with that, even with a good team? And even within your good team, how do you know if it's time to bring in a different collaborator? If that good team at the beginning isn't working as you get to the middle or the end? Well, I usually just storm out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> or one of the people who is going to be responsible for raising the money and convincing people that this is a really good idea and um, shepherding it and you know, taking such a long time. The time that I know that the collaboration is not working is when I don't know what the piece is about. So I know that I've been saying that already, but it's with, with the best of intentions and you know, the, the idea is like simmering up here somewhere, but nobody can actually say, well, this is what it's about. This is the foundation of this. So in that particular process, that was the moment that I knew that 
this collaboration wasn't going to work. And by the way, these were very, very talented people. Um, so it was not for any reason other than, well, I mean, maybe the idea wasn't good. Maybe that's why they couldn't come up with it. Um, so it wasn't a matter of anyone's fault. It just wasn't happening. And at some point, I had to be the one to release ourselves from each other. And sometimes that goes well, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I can just kind of feel it. And it's that feeling that Leslie said, and Christian says, like, oh, you don't really want to do it anymore. You kind of lose the juice. I also think it's a, like, I think we get very, a lot of people get very obsessed with the idea that, like, as soon as there's a whiff of conflict in the world, it's bad. You know, or that that's, that that's a bad thing. I actually totally... Louder, please. Uh, sorry? Louder. Oh, louder. Louder. <laughs> um, yeah, the conflict is inherent. Like, there is sort of, a, 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 you know, I think people do presuppose that, that conflict is somehow dangerous or bad or is going to lead you to disaster. And I actually really don't think so. I mean, there are ways to have conflict in the room. If everybody is oriented towards the work, in the way, if you've done your homework and you've, you've set up to use the ad word conditions <coughs> so that people can succeed, conflict should lead you actually to a better solution. But the, I really believe that the tension between two ideas or two people who are trying to find a way to communicate about a solution to a particular problem in their rehearsal room is the way towards coming up with, that's how you get to something better than either one person or other of, you know, whatever many people are in the conversation could come up with on their own. That's how you, that's how you solve it. I also think you have to privilege, no matter what your discipline, I really believe in privileging that the best idea in the room has to win and has to be acknowledged. Not everybody always agrees on what the best idea is, but you kind of know it when you see it, usually. And, and the ability to sort of fight your way towards a solution, which then everybody can recognize while putting their own ego aside, is the best solution to a problem, is, is the way to kind of orient people from the room. So that it doesn't become personal. It's about like, well, this is, this, we know what we're trying to do. We disagree. This is the solution that's come up with. We've come up with four solutions. This is the best one. I can agree that mine wasn't the best. Or, you know, I think directors run into a lot of trouble when they feel that they have to have the solution to everything. Um, or writers, actually. You know, there's been actors solve problems, designers solve problems. And if you can, if you can let go of the assumption that it's your job to own all of those decisions, yeah. then you end up having the right kind of, I wouldn't call it conflict in the middle, you end up having friction instead of conflict. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I don't really know how to deal with it. I, I, get, I can get very frustrated in a room and, and not know how to express myself well. Yeah. To be really truthful. I have not been able to resolve conflicts well sometimes. Um, I haven't known how to suppress my fear and need in the kind of way that make people able to listen to me. I haven't been able to do these things. I just have to say. Oh, I, me too. I'm just saying those are the things that I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's the things we need to try to do. It doesn't mean that there's a system in place. Right. You know, they're, there's, you they're there's, 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 sometimes it's very basic. Like for instance, for me with my play night Armenians, it was always very important to me that Armenian people were in my play. I, ju I really, I wrote that play. I wanted Armenians to be the profile, the Armenian profile, just to be raised up. And and I had, I had good, well-known producers behind me. Um, and I was never, and it, the play got a lot of productions, and I'm so grateful to those that actually put in an Armenian, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it didn't ha ever happen to the degree that I wanted it to happen, and I never knew how to say it. I never knew how to make it something that seems so simple. 
You know, and I have to say that I'm grateful to Oscar Eustace because he did the play of Trinity Rep and he brought on 26 Armenians in the middle of the play and had them sing the national overhead anthem. It made no sense, but I appreciate it. He's <laughs> 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 <It was> Armenian. <laughs> That's Oscar Eustace, I'm telling you. That sounds like a good collaboration. It, it worked <laughs> out, yeah. <laughs> Trinity Rep. Um, well, let's open uh, the conversation. That's a great note to end on. Let's open the conversation up uh, to you guys. Do you have questions for the panel? Yeah. Uh, I do. I've often heard it said that uh, theater is the writer's medium and film is the director's, which is probably an oversimplification. But I, I guess I'm a little concerned by Christopher saying that he sometimes banishes the writer from a movie. Not from Christian. It's Christian. Christian, sorry. Um, I, I just wondered, like, what part of the process would a writer's hearing it not be, actually be unwelcome? Um, because it stresses people out. Mm -hmm. and, because, <laughs> and, yeah. because, and because sometimes, um, sometimes you, you reach a point in rehearsal, and it's not near the beginning, nor is it near the end. It's usually somewhere in the middle, mm -hmm. where you need the freedom as a director to fuck it up. To make mistakes. Mm -hmm. It's you true. Know, and, uh, and to not get it right, and yeah. to wrangle with the actors in your own way, to let them make some choices that you know they have in mind that the writer is not going to like, um, to to find your way into thorny parts of the material that you may feel you need to solve that the writer hasn't solved, and you don't know how to have the conversation yet about that. Sometimes I don't know how to talk about a particular piece of the play that. I don't think it works, but I don't know why. Uh, until I kind of sit with it and let it be good and let it be bad and let my work be bad and let you know, probably terrible staging ideas. And there's a point in that process which is usually just torture for the writer because they're just watching they're just watching their work be ruined left and right. And I mean I remember having this very specific experience um, uh, with a with Tina Howe, actually, when I directed the play of several years ago at the Atlantic, and it was a big deal for me that I was going to do this particular play. I loved it for a long time, and, and it was a play that she had waited decades, literally, to have produced in New York, and so the stakes were very high for her. But it was very complicated and stylistically very strange and shifting in tone, and there was a point at which I just said, and it, I didn't kick her out in some sort of, you know, fury. I just sort of said, Tina, I think this is the moment where I need to work on this, and then I want to show it to you after I've come up with something, because I, I will want your feedback on it, but I don't, I, I can't, I can't net build it with you here in the room, it was stressing me out too much, you know, like my stakes in serving what I thought she wanted were also high, and I didn't feel, I, I felt her presence in a way that was um, not, that was, was about my neurosis, and that probably more than anything she was doing, but it was, it was about, you know, and you do go, and she was incredibly she's about that. I mean, she's been around the block a bunch, and she was like, yeah, I, I know this is the moment where I, gotta get, I have to go away. You tell me when you want to come back. I mean, it's a matter of dates. It wasn't, you know, please. Did she like what you did? Yeah. Um, yes and no. She came back and said, this piece of what you did was, was like, she described one scene that I had directed as sort of balletic and elegant and exactly what she had in mind. And she said, and you haven't, you haven't, taken the same responsibility for the other one that comes in the second act. And I said, oh, okay. And she was right. But I, and it was, and I, it, and I was bummed to hear it at the time, but I, 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 knew, I knew she was right. And I, but I, I knew that we were in the right place with it. I, I, wouldn't, it would, I wouldn't have been able to hear it if she had been there the whole time. I would have just felt for the time. Well, is it, uh, are some of these problems because the writer just isn't being clear and just the writer hasn't done their job? No. <laughs> <laughs> Good work, playwrights. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I would wish, I would, I'd wish writers, whether I was directing a play or producing a play or working as a dramaturg, to, to clarify things that I think are working. It's not about like anything goes necessarily, but, but if I'm directing a play, it, it, it's at some point, it's my job to deliver what, what's there and, and in conversation with the writer. But um, uh, yeah, I actually I don't. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, my question kind of ties.
ties in to, to, to this last thing you touched on. My question is in, in regards to rewrites. And Leslie, you sort of told us about a bad experience you had, especially with the play that we're going to see part of tonight. Um, but are, uh, how does rewriting factor into a, a good collaborative process? I mean, are, is there time? Is there, is there a really good time for it? Is there a time when it's wrong? Is it wrong for a director to ask for rewrites? You know, just sort of, um, besides the horror stories, which I think maybe we, we know a lot about, are there times when it's good? Or are there, is it, you know, are there rules to abide by in, in general, like to, to cut it out or to bring it in? Just some of that. I, I think that when you're working with a new play, that you rewrite all the way through tech, and then you rewrite all the way through previews. I, I think some people do that and some people don't. But I think that, um, for instance, David Ray just had a play off Broadway that was directed by Joe Bonney. And he rewrote and rewrote and rewrote and rewrote all the way through the whole thing. And he's really glad he did. He's glad he had that director. He's glad he changed the play the way he changed it. And, and, and Nikki Silver went on Broadway and took out a whole monologue that was happening in his play once they, so it's like, it's the way you learn about a play because plays are not meant to be read alone in a room. You learn about the play as it comes to life. So in the first, in the beginning sections, it's interesting, you can learn about your play from the first read around the table in rehearsal when actors are still just finding their way into it. You can hear what's right. And, and then how you hear it, you experience as the play starts to grow and you just, if, 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 if you trust your environment, it's great when you keep focusing and, and keep working toward it. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of rewrites and my plays need them, but others not so much. You know, Rich Greenberg writes a play, it's, it's in darn good shape right away. Um, he doesn't really have to do a lot of that, but it's how you know yourself, how you're inspired by what's around you. To me, I need to hear it over and over and over again. And you adjust one thing in the beginning and you adjust something at the end because this affects that. And also for a new play, once you have an audience, you really start. Yeah, right. Like, a lot. The previews, yeah. So, uh, there's a good example I can think of with this, actually. It's, it's a caution. It, it, the process you described is also the reason why it's a little dangerous, a lot dangerous, to have too many readings in the play. Yeah. Um, yeah. In line with what we were talking about yesterday with, with Chris. Um, that because I think writers unconsciously begin to write, rewrite their play to what works in a room around people. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking of the play that Leslie and I worked on together, <coughs> which is a play that functioned exceedingly differently around the table than it did up on its feet. Yes, I'll say. It was a play that was had six characters, each in, in, in three pairs, essentially, each of which were essentially in a discrete space and having overlapping storylines where they crossed over into the different spaces, but also had overlapping dialogue for most of the play. Um, so, you know, actor A in, in room one over here, in living room one over here, was actually taking his cue from actor C over here in the bedroom, not in the same house. So they weren't able to hear each other at all. And around the table, that works swimmingly well because you can just read it fast and, and, it, and it, it sings, it sings, and it always did. Yeah. Um, once you actually add to that all the physical business that was in that show, which there was a lot, um, and the traffic pattern, and the simple difficulty of having to remember that stuff for an actor and having to having actors of various abilities to learn lines. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and that's that's to criticize any one of them, but it was a play in which uh, we could never see if it could work until they were cold. But that took a long time for a couple of people to play, and that that made it very hard to do. But anyway, as soon as you added all those physical elements, rewrites needed to happen in order to keep the play moving in the way Leslie had always intended it to move, which it did successfully around the table. It needed. She had to pay that attention to it right. in the process. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, it would have been dead in the body. Yeah. And it wasn't because the play didn't work. It was because right. what was required. Yeah. Um, I, I want to say uh, something also about uh, you know, collaborations. Everybody's got to understand what their job is. And um, 
I don't think that I have been guilty of this, or maybe I'm just blocking it out. <laughs> um, but you know, as a producer, I don't give notes to actors. If I have something to say, I talk to the director. If I have a relationship with the writer, you know, sometimes that happens, but my direct channel is to the director. And I do not interfere with the relationship between the director and the actors, the director and the designers, the director, and I don't interfere with the director and the writer even when I have a relationship. And that is so important because it is a path to disaster. Because um, you can't hear all of that static and, and make sense of it. And the relationship from the director to the actors in particular is so vital. Now, I'm not saying that the writers don't talk to the actors, but that's still kind of in the inner sanctum. So, and I'm saying that I, I realize that you know, everyone here is a writer, but if you get into that situation where people are sort of pushing their way into where they don't belong, as the writer, you have the position and the right to say, I think this might work better if we followed this channel. Mm -hmm. um, and now, you know, on, on Broadway, there are nine million producers, all of whom think that they actually have produced yeah. the play or the musical. You do see this, and all of a sudden there's, you know, like Joe Blow with a checkbook going over to somebody in the show. It's like, oh, what are you doing? And another thing that I have established when I'm, if I'm the lead producer or something, uh, um, I require everybody to send me, their, the producers, to send me their notes in writing. Because you have got, I don't want to just sit there and listen to you spin. You take the time, you sit down, you put it in writing, and then I can read through it, absorb it, share with the director. But, you know, I have to protect that play and Players. We had to hire, we did hire, but when, when Spring Awakening moved from the Atlanta to Broadway, there was a, a producer wrangler that was hired. Because right. <laughs> there, was, there was so many people about the title on that yep. show because yep. they had a hard time raising the money. And it was one of the first notable ones that had a million people under the title. And, uh, uh, and there were so many people who had such an agenda that they had to have somebody who made sure that those people didn't show up in their customers. Oh. And they had to make sure that those oh. people were sending their feedback directly to the real producers yeah. so that they could filter it and yeah. process it and ignore it most of the time. <laughs> um, but respectfully, so that the people yeah. who were giving these, writing these big checks felt that they were being heard. But, but, but um, yeah, it was because otherwise it would have been made. Yeah. And I have gotten good notes from people sure. who are smart and even if they're not experienced. Um, you know, I'm not saying that. Oh, yeah, send me your notes so that I can delete them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you have to be judicious about it and be respectful of the very delicate, vulnerable nature of the play, from you know, what's on the page to what we're going to really experience in front of an audience. And, um, uh, interference is um, a negative thing. <coughs> Any more questions? Yes. Yeah, in, in line with that, how much theatricality for the show do you expect the writer to supply? Uh, or, I mean, I've been told I, I, I direct the play too much in the script. Um, and also, one other word I haven't heard brought up in all this week is the idea of concept. Do, do you, is that still a popular idea? That the creative team operates concept? out of a concept? <coughs> Sorry? Like a directorial concept, essentially? Um, well, the, the famous group, uh, Prince and Solomon and that group, all these. Um, a concept musical. Well, a concept show. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I actually heard Boris Johnson say that uh, 
I was walking around Wall Street one day and I realized what a physically alienating city this is, so I called Stephen and he bought a company. Now, you know, I'm, I'm sure uh, 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 the twigs, uh, George Burke, you know, had good, 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 good stories too, but um, I always find it. That's the kind of of I mean, I think in terms of the writing, the, what the what writer's role is supposed to be in sort of prescribing theatricality, I don't, I don't think there is one. I think some writers take care of a lot and leave, uh, leave kind of a roadmap. And uh, others really don't. Others really leave it open you know, to interpretation. I think it's, each writer is, has it, that I know, has a totally different disposition towards what uh, how much rope they want to give the rest of the creative team to kind of interpret and deliver something different than others, you know, others, you know. Um, I don't know, yeah, I don't, I don't really think, think, think I hear people talking a lot about sort of coming together with a concept so much, but. Do you know why people tell you that your play seem to be directed by you? What, what is it that you're doing that is making Oh, I had, I had too much stage direction. That's what I thought. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I can respond a little bit to that, to this too much stage directions. I, I, and maybe, maybe you can tell me what you think about this. I think the number of stage directions that are in place is, is kind of a thing that responds to fad. You know, there, there was a time, for instance, Tennessee Williams. Mm -hmm. Just so much, so, so detailed, so detailed in the stage direction, so precise about what he wanted, it, 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 before the play even started, we knew so much about it. Um, and then we moved into a period where it seemed all of a sudden more important and kind of cooler to have fewer stage directions. And then Carol Churchill wrote a play that had no stage directions at all. And it was one of the things that we pointed out in all the reviews as though it were a plus. Um, it, it's one of the things that I tell my students is that um, I think stage directions are sensitive to some sort of faddish evaluation, and that it's up to you to bring in what you think you need in your play to be able to tell your story. So it, it, I, I'm on the side of saying this is your choice if you think the story can be done. I will also add that I know that when I put in a lot of stage directions, it's one of the things I go back to when I finish my first draft, and I think what can come out of the stage directions and go into the intention of the characters so that it doesn't need to be up here. It can be between them somehow. So it's one of the things I look at as my own map of how to develop the play further. You know what I mean? Any final questions? Yes. I'm just thinking your first question. Condition is such a conditional word. Mm -hmm. And maybe yes. if you'd replaced it with situations, Leslie wouldn't have been so unhappy. <laughs> Talk to Ann Bogart. <laughs> <laughs> I, I worked my way through it. <laughs> no, but actually, like, not to, I actually think I, I, I know that quotation, and I know Ann very well. And I, Ann's speaking from her own point of view as a director of a company of actors. Yeah. Who, and, 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 in which they work with writers, but the, their, their work is not generally particularly writer-centric in, in, right. in the That's way right. that we're talking about. And That's right. So she's, you know, it's not, I think that, that we've discovered that actually that, that um, kind of applies to right. other modes of working, but that, that comes directly out of her experience with my system. And no disrespect for Ann Bogart. You can't disrespect Ann Bogart. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. she really is. One more thing is, in this morning's New York Times, there's a review of some new play, I don't remember what it is, but it had something like four authors, and they used the parable of things designed by committee. Was it the Women's Project? Was like for the yes, guys? yes, yes, I think so. I don't remember. And one of that had like eight, I think, or something like that. Well, yeah. There's collaboration, perhaps, run amok in most dangerous. Yes, I have a question. Um, John, when you were putting together, how, how, what, was there any difference between when you gathered the playwrights for Motherhood Out Loud and the playwrights for Standing on Ceremony? Did you, I mean, the one project started one way and the other project Completely started different. another? Completely different. 
Mother Without Loud started with an idea that Susan Rose and I had about a world that we wanted to explore and we wanted to bring in um, an ensemble of writers to explore this world. And um, Lisa Peterson, who directed it, had a lot to do with shaping it and giving that piece a sense of a journey. Um, Standing on Ceremony started as a benefit. Um, it started in Los Angeles and there were, I don't know how many writers were involved with it at that point, and then it went to the New York Theater Workshop. Um, and I have a long association with that theater and I went in to see this uh, benefit, which was, it was a benefit. It was three hours long and 35 actors and 25 pieces and you couldn't hear anything. and. It was a thrilling mess because it was really about something for me that I cared about. It was really about equality. It was really about, I mean, I understood from the first beat of that play that the world was gay marriage. But the heartbeat was about civil rights. The heartbeat was about, you know, if you can take away your rights, you can take away my rights. And it really spoke to me in a way that, um, that was just so urgent. And it had, um, and I had also determined several years ago that every play that I was producing would have some kind of philanthropic arm. So with Motherhood Out Loud, we benefit uh, organizations that help families. With Standing on Ceremony, benefit organizations that uh, work for marriage equality. Um, as I started to you know, take that big collection of writers and, start, and, and saw, for me, that there was a 90-minute piece that could be just as effective and maybe a little easier to sit the 90 minutes rather than three hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started to pull pieces. So I started to look at it and say, well, what hasn't been said? Because a lot of pieces duplicated you know, the ideas. And, uh, and that was frustrating sometimes because I would get submissions from really good writers, but they were saying the same thing. If I had to make a choice about what was going to fit into the puzzle of that evening. So standing on ceremony is something that was almost presented to me as an idea. And then it was my job to curate it, develop it, and help to make it an evening that would be fun and meaningful. And I also had this idea that you know this is going to be like a party. And uh, when we were developing it in Los Angeles, we were in spaces that invited the opportunity after every performance, we served wedding cake. So, and it inspired conversation, and then also we had the opportunity for people to sign up to volunteer for various organizations we were working with. So, but it was a, a delicate balance because you don't want to sell spinach. You know, you want to, it was a stage, a, a stage play, and it was, it was fun. And, and also, you look at that collection of writers, and even though I couldn't get Chris Durant to write a piece, he would have fit beautifully into that group. <laughs> but, but also, when I, when I reached out to Chris, you know, you said to me, well, I don't really have an idea. You just have to respect that. Um, but it's, I mean, some of it was just getting out of the way. Because look at that list of beautiful writers in both Motherhood Out Loud and in standing on ceremony, and that's when you just say, okay, you know, do no harm. Cool. Thank you. I think that's all we have time for. Um, so let's thank our lovely panel. <laughs>
um, City Theater uh, paired with the Broward Center to bring this down, along with Joan, um, and uh, it runs from June 21st to 24th. Uh, so we encourage you all, of course, to come and see it. Um, it is the South Florida and really southeastern premiere of the East, right? Mm -hmm. 